The average application has 26.7 vulnerabilities, which is a horrific number. You never fly on an airline if when you checked an airplane, it had 26.7 safety problems. I think the game's changed. You have to be secure to sell to these big enterprises. You know, they're seeing the same breaches we're seeing. They're not going to trust their enterprise to some little company that's not doing the right security stuff. And I, I get it. When you're a small company, it's very difficult to not only build the thing you're trying to build, but also do all this security work. You're listening to the Enterprise Ready Podcast, a show aiming to change the enterprise software narrative from how to sell to enterprises to how to build for enterprises. We'll interview industry experts and enterprise software founders as we break through the jargon, establish a common vernacular, and share the lessons learned from building the world's best enterprise software. Hi, I'm Grant Miller, creator of Enterprise Ready and founder and CEO of Replicated, where we power the world's best enterprise software. The Enterprise Ready Podcast is brought to you by Heavybit, a program dedicated to helping startups take their developer products to market. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, or just learn more about enterprise features, find us at enterpriseready.io. In this episode of the Enterprise Ready Podcast, we interview Jeff Williams, founder and CTO of Contrast Security. We explore Jeff's early career in cybersecurity, where he worked as a security consultant as the internet started to gain early traction. From there, we dive into his founding role at a security consulting firm, where he stayed very involved with the security ecosystem through his role as global chair of OWASP, where he helped create the OWASP Top 10. We spend a lot of time exploring Jeff's perspective on application security and how he's trying to change the approach from outside in to inside out by focusing on code instrumentation. Jeff also drops some tips about which compliance frameworks to pay attention to, how to build RBAC into your application by leveraging an application framework, insights into their top-down, go-to-market approach, and how they roll out new products. It really is a great listen, so I hope you enjoy the show. All right, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, Grant. All right, so let's just jump right in. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you're working on now? Sure. So I started writing software in uh, in high school, way back in the early 80s, uh, and uh, accidentally got into security along the way. My first job happened to be on a classified project for the Navy, where they had a really high level of security, so Orange Book level B2, if you anybody out there remembers that. I learned a lot about security. I really enjoyed it. So I, I kind of got on that career track. And uh, was, it, was that your first project for the Navy? Was that while you were in high school, or was that just after? Oh no, it's just after. It was my first job out of out of college. Okay, great. Yeah, I worked in a skiff, like in a safe underground with a bunch of like fifty to hundred people. Uh, it was uh, it was interesting. Wow, that's crazy. And it took us uh, three years. I spent on that project, and uh, you DevOps folks might be interested. We never released software one time. <laughs> Yeah, eventually Congress killed the line item for that project, and so it just it's on a shelf somewhere with the Ark of the Covenant. Oh my gosh, that has to be a little bit infuriating. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, my best programming years oh. gone. All right, so what did you get into after that? Well, like I said, I got into security, so I got hired by a security consulting company, and I went off and I, I became a security consultant for uh, 10 years or so. And, uh, and that was sort of right at the beginning of the dot-com boom, and uh, so I got to do AppSec for lots of the early dot-com companies. So that was really interesting, and it was you know it was when that field was evolving. So I feel like I got to participate in you know the very early stuff like SQL injection and cross-site scripting and you know all those standard vulnerabilities. We were just you know figuring them out. And along the way, I got pulled into OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, and I wrote this this thing that I called the OWASP Top Ten. And you know, it was a little side project, and I put it out there, and it just went crazy. People started downloading it. OWASP got slash dotted, and uh, you know, then a little while later, they asked me to take over as uh, the global chair of OWASP. So I really got entrenched in the AppSec community. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, that top ten list is still you know pretty well circulated. Well, it's funny. I feel I have two minds about it. Like in one sense, I like the fact that it's out there, and uh, you know, it raises awareness of, of ASIC. But on the other hand, like it's really not the way I think about application security at all. I'm really kind of a high assurance kind of person, not a, a checklist of the top vulnerabilities kind of person. You know, I don't feel like the top ten is you know has really changed anything. In fact, it's the same stuff that's in there. After you know, I wrote it in 2002, and it's 2019 now. It's still the same stuff. That's crazy. Yeah, that's kind of insane. 
is that while you were at Aspect that you were working with those dot com companies? Or yeah, so uh, it's actually at a company called Exodus Communications, which was a big data center company during the dot com boom that eventually went bankrupt. And when it went bankrupt, Dave Wickers and I spun out Aspect Security, and we sort of took the consulting work and uh, created our own practice. And uh, that company did really well. It, it grew for. Uh, we're almost 15 years, and then it just sold to Ernst & Young a couple years ago. Oh, amazing. And that brings us to your current role. Yeah, so uh, while I was at Aspect, uh, Arshan Debirziaghi and I uh, had this idea for a different kind of application security tool that worked based on instrumentation, sort of like a new relic or app dynamics for security, and that, that research at Aspect Eventually, we spun that out as a separate company called Contrast Security, and that's what I do now is I'm a CTO there. Yeah, okay. So I want to dive into a bunch of these different areas. So the first piece that I'd love to talk about, you know, you were just mentioning that you wrote the OAuth Top 10. I also saw that you wrote an ISO spec for security. So, you know, I'd love to just kind of get your perspective. Maybe first, let's start with the ISO one around these sort of standards and certifications because i think a lot of our listeners you know they hear you know from their customers that they want some kind of SOC 2 compliance or ISO 27000 certification and there's so many different competing standards and so how should an application vendor think about those options and and what should they be doing well so it's it, there are a ton of standards and there's really no very well accepted standards in application security so like that ISO standard you're talking about, that's called the System Security Engineering CMM. And, you know, we did that in the mid-90s. And it's a great document, but it never really achieved very widespread adoption. And so like a lot of other security standards, that you know, it's out there, but people don't really use it. You know, like I, I spent a lot of time in the high assurance world doing, you know, classified work and, and so on. And like those standards are great. Like if you're a security engineer, you should read the Rainbow series of documents because it's fantastic. Those guys knew more about security 30 years ago than you know a lot of companies know today. But it hasn't changed anything, right? I mean, there's all these standards. There's, uh, you know, like you mentioned, the NIST standards are probably the ones that have the most traction at this point. So if, if you're looking for a standard, I'd probably recommend you go look at the NIST cybersecurity framework if you're a CISO to give you a good sense of the kinds of things to work on. And, you know, NIST 853 has got all the standard controls in it and so on. So those are good standards. I, I think it's actually important, even if you're not a CISO, right? If you're a product manager who's building you know a tool for enterprises to use i think reading these specs is a really great way to get an understanding of the requirements that your customers are going to have right if you're trying to sell to you know the global 500 these requirements are pretty well spelled out in these documents wouldn't you say oh yeah for sure big enterprise customers are going to demand that you're compliant with things like NIST and, uh, you know, SOC 2, Type 2, and, and things like that. So it is a good start, but I think you're going to have to interpret those requirements for what you're really trying to do. Sure. Once I'd read the ISO spec, I sort of understood the playbook of a lot of the CISOs that I was trying to, to sell to, right? So yeah. questions you would be asked, you're kind of like, oh yeah, I know about that. I, it's, a, it's just a common way to think about the problem. Yeah, we actually have someone who does that pretty much full-time, is just handle these... Uh, Compliance kinds of checks from our various customers because we get these huge questionnaires that you know there's the, the thousand questions that we have to answer about how we do security. So you're going to want to get organized about it. Yeah, for sure. And I think having a pretty clear idea of of what those areas are is is a great way to do that. Yeah. Okay. So you know if we think about all these different criteria, you know, like the Rainbow Series or NIST, like do you think you should wait until your customers are asking you for a specific? Criteria? Or do you think you should just start with one and say, like, "Hey, we're going to f- try to follow ISO twenty seven thousand, or we're going to try to follow, you know, some standard that's out there?" Well, actually, what I really think the most efficient way to do it is to kind of focus on the big rocks early, and you know, make sure you're on a path to where you can get compliance with those requirements over time. But you know, you're not going to be able to do everything when you're a little startup with no funding. You know, you, you've got to be uh, kind of strategic about which things you do. So. You know, you may choose uh, something like access control or like logging or something. You know, something that's you know, some, maybe it's single sign-on 
whatever you think uh, is going to be the most important thing. And then as you get bigger and you get uh, more security folks on board, you can complete your story. And most organizations are willing to work with you on that kind of stuff. It's not like when you go in and you get these thousand question questionnaires, if you fail one, they're going to just say, nope, can't use you. A lot of them will work with you uh, to make sure that you meet their requirements. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, I always sort of joke that these vendor security questionnaires are filled out sort of with the rose-colored glasses, right? So, oh yeah, we, you know, every laptop we have has, you know, the latest and greatest version of every browser and operating system on it. And it's like, well, like, is that really true? Or is there some laptop like sitting in a back room that doesn't have that? You know, like, how do you think about the sort of full truthfulness that most vendors fill out these questionnaires with? Yeah, I think there's a little bit of license there. I don't. We're a little different. So when I was in, in a consulting company, you know, imagine we had uh, forty or fifty consultants, all with their own laptops, all going on site to various customer locations, and we were doing manual code reviews and manual pen tests. So we had access to their, you know, their source code and their most sensitive systems. And I knew that if any one of those laptops got compromised, that that was a existential threat to my business. So I, I put in a very extensive process there to make sure that you know all the protections were in place. We audited them continuously. So we really took it extremely seriously and we brought some of those practices over into contrast. So you know we're, we're pretty tight about it, but I'm sure that uh, there are some things that we've answered that aren't completely uh, displayed yeah. across every system that we have. Right. I mean, in this last being about contrast, right? Because I mean, you obviously take this super seriously. This is like a part of what you do. But I think just the industry as a whole, the responses to vendor security questionnaires are, to me, less about the actual implementation. They're more just like cover your ass if you're the enterprise and make sure that someone attested to all these things that you want them to have said they've done. Yeah. The other side of it is that it does make companies do more of the right thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that they help drive in the right direction. So that's a great point. What I find is when they ask the questions, like they'll ask a question, you know, like, do you do X, Y, Z? And, you know, maybe technically the answer is no, right? Because you're not doing exactly what that question asks. But if you dig underneath the question and think about why are they asking this? Like, what is the concern that they're thinking about? Then usually you can say, oh, I understand now. Well, here's what we do to address that risk. And you explain to them what you do and why you do it, and they're perfectly willing to listen. Yeah, I, th- I think to your point, if you think about security and you're doing things and, you, and you're threat modeling and you're spending time understanding what the different vectors are and how you could be compromised, and you're trying to address those pieces, then you're, you're right. But I think just a lot of companies out there don't really understand the extent at which they could be compromised and their software could be or their employees could be and they just don't really I mean I, I say that because I know that like for my first company I had no idea right I was just yeah you know we were using every application we saw and didn't really matter we'd put data anywhere you know I probably was reusing the same password you know, it was just like things that I did because I you know I didn't start my career in a in an air gapped environment I started my career at like a consumer software company and so right you know I think there's just a lot of people out there that don't really get it right away. And so I think the industry as a whole needs to continue to move forward and educate and, and continue to push people to, to really adopt these security best practices. Well, I think the game's changed. You know, it's become an environment where you have to be secure to sell to these big enterprises. You know, they're seeing the same breaches we're seeing. They're not going to trust their enterprise to some little company that's not doing the right security stuff. And I, I get it when you're a small company. It's very difficult with your limited funding to not only build the thing you're trying to build, but also do all this security work. It's a real trade-off kind of challenge that you've got to address. Yeah, there's a lot there to do. Before we jump off this topic, I would love to just you know, hear a little bit of the story. You kind of mentioned that the OWASP top 10 list sort of just took off. And so what kind of inspired you to create this? And then you, know, you said it got slash-sided, which is, which is a, a, you know, a great reference, kind of a throwback to how things used to go viral, right? So, you know, just t- kind of tell that story really quick. So, kind of, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. So, uh, look, at that time, OS was a mailing list. There were like twenty or twenty-five people on it, and someone recommended that I joined. Uh, so, I, I joined this list, and that they were building a guide for writing secure code, and uh, that's was an interesting project. And then they started talking about building a 
an environment where people could experiment with vulnerabilities. And I had already built something just like that for the training that I did in AppSec. So I thought about it, I was like, if OWASP builds one, everyone's going to use that. And my thing will just die on the vine. So why don't I just donate it to OWASP? And so I, I donated this project, I called it WebGoat. And it's just a safe environment for people to experiment with application security without you know hacking into uh, Facebook or something. And the response was unbelievable. I mean, people just loved it. And I realized as a consulting company, donating stuff to OWASP sends all the right messages about what we were doing. It says we're experts. It says we're passionate. It says we care enough to contribute this stuff. So I really got hooked on it. And then later that year when I had this idea for the OWASP Top 10, I was like, I could publish it myself and nobody would read it, or I could publish it through OWASP and everyone will read it. And so I, I did that, and that project took off. It was very rewarding for me personally to try to make the world a better place, but it was also really good for Aspect. And I encourage every company to contribute to open source efforts because it really does send the right message about your company. And it's a much better way of advertising than wasting, you know, $150,000 on a booth at some big conference, you know, take that money and invest it in some open source tool. You'll probably get much more interesting business out of it. Yeah, that's, I, I love that. I mean, I think that's become a very popular way to, for companies to go to market, right? Is around open source, is around content. These are super critical to the go to market strategy today. And I mean, you were doing it, you know, 15, 20 years ago. That's pretty amazing. Well, later I learned about content based marketing. And I saw a lot of people trying to do it. And basically, they're just writing blogs about other people's content, which I think is really weird. Like content-based marketing should start with content. You should you should make something interesting that nobody knows. You know, it could be a study, it could be a paper, it could be a tool, it could be it's make some make something cool. Then talk about it. That's content-based marketing to me. Not just a hot take on somebody else's things. Right. That's funny. Yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, so OWASP kept growing. I was asked to take over as the global chair shortly after that, and uh, I did that for nine years. And we grew OWASP to, you know, now it's huge. There's hundreds of chapters around the world. There's dozens of conferences every year, lots of training and, and great tools and projects going on. So I stepped away about five years ago when I started Contrast because there's, there's a limit to how much you can do in a day. But, you know, you were acting as the global chair for several years, right? Oh, yeah, for almost nine years, yeah. And that was while you were also running Aspect, which was a, a more of a consulting organization, right? Exactly right, yeah. Consulting is really interesting. Like, if you're going to build an enterprise product, consulting in whatever that field is for as much time as you can is amazing. Because I feel like I spent years and years working directly with the people who are going to buy my product, right? So I got to learn exactly what their concerns are. I learned exactly how their use cases work across, you know, hundreds of companies. And that's really what allowed us to build contrast. Without that experience, I don't think we would have gotten the product right. I don't think we could have even known what the, the right features were or how it should work. Yeah, and at uh, Aspect, were you also sort of recommending different application vendors? Yeah, uh, it wasn't something that was a big part of our business. We didn't resell any products we tried to use some of the products that were on the market, like static analysis tools and dynamic scanners and WAFs in solutions that we were working with our clients on, but I never found any of those tools particularly useful. In fact, I think they might do more harm than good in some cases. So, uh, you know, the service that we provided was largely manual penetration testing and manual code review, which, you know, is fantastic. And it actually, I think, scales better in a lot of ways than the other tools in the AppSec space. Oh, interesting. So you weren't trying to resell or integrate different technologies, and then you weren't selling any technology either. You were just selling consulting services, is that right? That's right. It was just consulting. And then why not introduce a product alongside of Aspect? You know, why spin out a new company in order to do this? You know, if you want to spin out a company, you've got to have a really good idea. We did a little bit of product, like we had an e-learning product that we made and sold at Aspect. But when we had the idea for Contrast, we realized it really needed to be a separate company. And it just doesn't work like business-wise to have a product company and a consulting company smashed under one entity. The business models are very different. The selling motion is very different. The marketing is very different. It really just needs to be a separate company. Okay, sure. But you were able to take your years of experience and 
you know, all the knowledge that you gained. And that's what you're saying as, as a application vendor to have worked as a consultant for so long and to have run a consulting company and seen so many different enterprise use cases, you felt particularly well prepared to solve this problem with these enterprise customers. That's exactly right. Yeah. Because we'd work side by side with them solving the problem that, uh, you know, that they needed a product to solve. And the only problem with doing manual consulting is that it, it just doesn't scale. So we needed automation, but we couldn't find it from the existing scanning tools. So uh, we were always looking for a new way to solve that problem. And uh, you know, when the Java Instrumentation API came out in 2009, we thought, hey, this could be it. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. so let's let's talk a little bit about you know because you have a fairly particular perspective on application security and the future of application security. You know, which I think is is super relevant for the various application vendors out there. So let's kind of dive into a little bit of that and, and maybe provide some context and background and then and then your perspective. Sure. So, you know, AppSec is pretty hard. I think of network security a little bit like Lego because it's kind of constrained in the way you can fit things together. But AppSec is more like clay. Like you can build anything with software. And so there's many more degrees of freedom in screwing things up. And so... I see the future of AppSec as moving away from scanning and firewalling. Like I think that approach has run its course. Those tools don't have enough information to be really accurate about AppSec. And because they're not accurate, it means you have to have experts involved. And if you have experts involved, it's really not automation. It's just experts with tools. And it doesn't scale. And so the biggest problem I see in organizations is the ability to scale AppSec. And as software gets released faster and faster, the workload on the security experts goes up and up and up unless we figure out a better way to automate. So for me, the transition is about getting from this outside-in kind of approach of scanning and firewalling to an embedded approach where the security is happening within the thing that we're trying to protect. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it sounds a little bit like it's harder to tack that on later and it needs to be built more into the actual application. Is that right? Well, there's kind of two pieces. There's like the security defenses, which you have to build in and you got to build them in over time as you build the product. But then there's the verification of those defenses that has to be happening kind of continuously as you're building the product. So what we found was, you know, if you're analyzing just the source code, you kind of get one view of an application. And if you're looking at the HTTP traffic like that a scanner would put out, you see another view of the application. And if you're looking at the libraries and frameworks, you get another view of what's in that. And if you're looking at a, a WAF or something, it's sort of a different view of the app. And none of those different views have all the information. It's a little bit like that parable of the blind man and the elephant, like each person can only see one part of the elephant, and so they make all these mistakes about what it is they're looking at. And that's really what we see in AppSec tools, is uh, you know all these point tools that do their thing, but they make a lot of mistakes. So what we thought is, hey, if we could get inside the application, the same way that like a, a profiler or a, an app dynamics gets inside the application, then we could measure all that stuff. We could see the code, we could see the libraries, we could see the data flow and control flow, we could see backend connections and configuration and libraries and frameworks. And we'd have this huge information advantage so that we could accurately see vulnerabilities and report them to the folks that need them immediately. And then we could also identify attacks the same way and prevent them from exploiting applications. And this isn't just happening at the application layer, like this trend to secure things from the inside is happening across the whole stack. So we see it in cloud products uh, like ThreatStack. We see it in OS products that are moving inside the application. Even some of the traditional scanning vendors like uh, Tenable, now instead of scanning from the outside, now you get an agent that runs within the, the platform itself. Cool. And so you know, if I'm an application vendor and I'm, you know, I'm selling either a SaaS product or distributing it privately for folks to install, how should I think about this? Should I be integrating... You know this with my application when I am running it in the cloud. How, how do I how do I do this? Yeah, so I think there's again there's two pieces, right? There's what you do during development to make sure that the thing that you're producing is secure, and then there's what you do in operations to make sure that your application is defending itself in the environment that it gets deployed in. So during development, 
you want to make sure that you get those tight feedback loops on security. So as soon as your developers make a mistake with the security, like let's say they introduce a SQL injection flaw, there should be instrumentation that detects that vulnerability and reports it right to them through the tools they're already using. And hopefully it takes, you know, it comes back within like a second, right? That's the most cost-effective way of doing security. And then if you do that process, you'll be producing applications that are relatively free from vulnerabilities. And we're not doing that today. The average application has 26.7 vulnerabilities, which is a horrific number. You never fly on an airline if when you checked an airplane, it had 26.7 safety problems. True, you'd never take off, right? You'd be sitting on the runway the whole time. Yeah, of course. But we put out code that's like that all the time. And these are, you know, these are the apps you use every day. Online banking, uh, you know, your healthcare apps, everything. It's all like that. So if you do what I'm suggesting and, and get that process in place so you can get instant feedback on the code that you're building, developers will fix those problems in stride and check in clean code. And you won't build up this backlog of vulnerabilities. I know organizations that have 30,000, 40,000 vulnerabilities in their backlog that they're not even getting to. And so then, you know, if you do that, you should be getting to production with something that's relatively clean, which is great. But if you're out there in production and people are using your application, maybe it's on-prem somewhere and it's not getting updated frequently, a new vulnerability could get discovered in some library or a new class of vulnerabilities could get discovered that you know nobody knew about when you were writing the code. So you want to have that runtime protection in place so that your application can defend itself against both you know, known vulnerabilities as well as novel attacks. And that seems to me like that kind of belt and suspenders seems like a really good balanced approach to application security if you do those two things. Okay, great. Just for reference, contrast plays in both those worlds? Yeah, so we're a little unique there. You know, in, in using traditional tools, you need to buy a SAS tool and a DAS tool. That's a static analysis tool and a dynamic scanner. You probably also need to buy a uh, an open source analysis tool like a Black Duck or something. And then you'd probably need to buy a WAF to protect it in production. Contrast does all of those things. Because we work from inside the application, we analyze the app as you're building it. We analyze all your libraries and frameworks and tell you if you've got any known vulnerabilities. And then in production, Contrast protects the application against being exploited. So we make vulnerabilities like SQL injection and expression language injection and XXE and a bunch of different other kinds of vulnerabilities impossible to exploit. Should those vulnerabilities have been, did you already detect them in the development environment, but the team just didn't have time to fix them? And so they're deploying it even though they know there's vulnerabilities. And so your software is, you know, sort of being the, the gatekeeper to protect those vulnerabilities before, you know, even though they, they know that they're an issue? That's a common way to use contrast is to give you that breathing room so you can deploy even with vulnerabilities and then you know go back and clean those vulnerabilities up later. But I think even if you banned applications from going to production with vulnerabilities, there's still a great use case for putting uh, some runtime protection in place because you know, of these new vulnerabilities that come out, you know, there's dozens of new CVEs get reported every week. And, you know, if your application is using one of those libraries, then you need to fix it within about a day. Uh, so if you think about the Equifax breach, I'm sure you read about, they were using an old version of Struts, and it had an expression language injection vulnerability in it. And they took, you know, several months, three or four months, actually, to get on top of that. And in the meantime, uh, the attackers breached their application. It was a total host compromise, so the attackers could do anything they wanted on those hosts for quite a long time. Those are the kinds of things that you need to be able to respond to almost immediately because as soon as those new vulnerabilities come out, we see a huge rise in automated attacks across all of our customers get attacked by these things almost immediately. So people are weaponizing these things and turning them into scanners to just search the internet for, for those vulnerabilities right away. So I think you got about a day. Great. And so from a vendor's perspective, if I'm using a tool like Contrast, can I use this to help demonstrate the security of the application that I'm you know, hosting or delivering to my customers? Is there like some type of, you know, because one of the challenges with uh, an annual pen test and white box code review is that 
This is a point in time analysis, right? And so, you know, with something like contrast, am I able to produce something that is very up to date, like, you know, as of the day they requested it and sort of show them consistently that, hey, this is our almost like uptime, right? It's like, here's what our uptime was for, you know, responding to CVEs and, and things like that. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, this idea that you get a security test done, you know, right before production deployment, you know, that, that's uh, an, an ancient concept. I think really what you want today is continuous application security verification and reporting. A lot of government standards are moving that way. Actually, government is kind of ahead of the game here in terms of the continuous compliance kind of movement. So there's a number of standards like uh, the SANS stuff and the some of the uh, the NIST things are moving towards compliance. The PCI standard also moving towards continuous compliance. And the idea is you shouldn't ever really be untested. You should be continuously testing for security problems. So yeah, Contrast provides that evidence where you can be a continuously up to date dashboard on every one of your applications in parallel. It's cool. I'm debating it with myself if there's an interesting concept, which is you know if obviously there's things like status page for uptime, right? You can show you know there's Different outages, different companies have, and so Salesforce was down, and Google Calendar was down, and so you know everyone's showing their status, uh, and there's obviously status pages a company, and just showing the status of uptime, and so there's a interesting level of transparency you could provide if if you sort of publicly share some of these dashboards around, you know the the continuous sort of security and CVEs or other aspects of your security to your customers, right, for their information. You know, obviously, there's a level of of challenge here because you know if you have CVEs, you don't want to say, "Hey, we're running this CVE in production," because then it's going to make you a target. But yeah, I mean, do you have any thoughts on on in sort of making that more available to customers or publicly? Yeah, so I'm trying to make that day happen, and uh, I've put forth a lot of ideas around that concept. So I just wrote a piece for Forbes that challenges companies that says, you know, hey, who's going to be the company in your sector that decides to do security right? And does it publicly? A little bit like Microsoft's trustworthy computing initiative from uh, you know the early two thousands. They turned that company around and they made security public in a lot of ways. So I talk a lot about you know doing security in sunshine. It's really important to do it internally anyway, right? Like security doesn't thrive when people you know turn it into shame and blame and. That's when I think security gets bad culture-wise. It's really best to be very open about security internally, at least, to talk about, you know, here's what threats we have, here's who's attacking us, here's what the attacks look like, here's where we're vulnerable. Everybody should know that. That gets your company aligned on security and makes it, you know, drives the importance of it for developers. So I would strongly encourage you to take some of the attack data that hopefully you're, you're seeing application layer attacks and you've got some visibility. Take that data and make sure developers can see it every day so they know how important security is. That kind of culture, I think, is really powerful. So you know, I encourage you to do what you can about making it visible internally and hopefully someday, eventually, I'd love to see a day when companies are public about their application security efforts. I mean, right now, think about your online bank. What do you really know about how they do security? Remember, you're trusting them with your finances, all of you know, a lot of your personal information, maybe a lot of your transactions, they know all that. And you're trusting them, but my guess is you have absolutely no idea who wrote the software, how they were trained, how they tested that software for security, how it was deployed, whether they have known vulnerabilities in their open source, how often they do security testing. I, I bet you don't know any of that. That's really scary. I call that blind trust, and it's dangerous. It's funny, I don't think about it very much for myself, Personally, I do think about it a lot for the software that we use at Replicated because you know I think my personal finances I'm not as worried about as I am about the information that we have from our customers or you know that we could produce internally and, and you know I think that's a much more it's orders of magnitude more valuable. So I'm very conscious about you know how we use that software and what we do for security at Replicated internally. So. Interesting. I bet most people think about their personal stuff first. Yeah, I mean, you know, I guess at the same time, you know, as a founder, most of my personal wealth would be tied up and replicated as well. So yeah, but it's not like credit cards. Like credit cards, you know, you're covered for fifty bucks. But if somebody breaks in your online bank and drains your account, there's a good chance it's just gone. Yeah, 
That's why you got to hold it all in a crypto wallet, you know, in, in Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Cool. So now that we know more about contrast, which is super helpful and sort of in just generally the perspective around security and application security and how vendors should be thinking about that, I think that's all really, really useful information. I'd love to dive into a little bit more of some of the enterprise ready components of contrast, right? So, you know, the first piece I think it's always interesting is just understanding how, when you started this company, how did you first go to market? Like, how did you get adoption? And then, you know, I think that that informs some of the other decisions you made around features to build. So can you talk a little bit about the origins of the company, how you got it out there, who your first users were? So Contrast started a little bit differently from most startups. Because we were being spun out of a consulting company, we already had, you know, a bunch of potential customers in mind. And they were all very large enterprises, like the largest Wall Street banks and some of the biggest international financial institutions like World Bank and IMF and the Federal Reserve and, and places like that. So when we built the product, we built it for those enterprises out of the gate. We didn't start with like an open source project and then make a commercial version and uh, you know move up from you know small companies to big companies. We went right for the biggest companies. So they pushed us really hard on those enterprise features right away. You know, we had to add uh, enterprise logging and access control and single sign-on and multi-factor authentication and all those things. We had to build those really early in our process. So did you self-fund? Did you raise money? Uh, you know, because oftentimes building those features can be a little bit, a uh, little costly. Uh, Aspect funded the first year of development. So we had a team of roughly 10 people working on the product for a year. And Aspect did that sort of, I, I think of it like a seed round, essentially. Sure. And we did well. We had some nice sales to some large organizations, and that really put us in a great position to go raise an A round, which we did. We raised a $8 million Series A in uh, 2014. Okay, great. So you were building this internally at Aspect. This makes a lot of sense. So, you, so when I asked you earlier, kind of like, oh yeah, it didn't make sense to you kind of spun it out of aspect. You started it there, you used those relationships, you sort of you know seed funded it with this experience and then you know had t- I mean 10 engineers on it. It's a pretty good sized development team. And so how many design partners or early customers were you working with at that point? Well, I wish we'd been smarter about that, but uh, you know, this was really our first steps in product development and so and it's a little bit hard if you're building a revolutionary product it's a little hard sometimes to work with design partners, at least at the early phase, because we had a vision of a, a different way of doing application security. Like we weren't a scanner and everyone's just looking for a better version of what they're doing today. And we had a very different idea and it was very difficult to show it in, in a partially finished form because people don't get it. They're like, well, where do I push the scan button? I'm like, no, we're not scanning. We're continuously monitoring in the background. There's no scanning. Yeah, can I stop a scan in progress? And it's just like those kind of questions. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know, we we did a lot more of that on our own, just with an idea of what we wanted it to be, than I probably would do today. I'd probably work more closely with partners if I had it to do over again. Yeah, I get it though. It's hard sometimes when you're trying to bring something that's not really well understood in the market you're trying to create a new category or in and, and that's that's a very difficult thing to do with early partners right you have to really find folks that truly get it from the beginning and they're not just looking for a better you know static code analysis tool yeah and it's tough in the early days when you have this vision but the product doesn't really work as well as you'd like that'll alienate your early partners pretty quickly so sometimes i think you got to just put your head down and build a flying car, and then show it to people, and then they'll get it. Sure, and so that first year while you were incubating it, did you have users, or did you wait until you had raised When did you kind of get the first people really using this? Oh, we definitely had users, so we sold to a few very large banks, and uh, we could have done better on customer support, I think. like That's really where I would have liked to uh, spend more time, is like, let's get a, a partner, let's get them using the product, and then let's really support them to make sure we make what they want. But we were really still, you know, instrumentation for security is, is tricky. Not every language has great instrumentation support. And so we had a lot of technical challenges to solve in those early years. And uh, we sort of spent our time doing that. And, you know, thank goodness we got enough 
commercial interest to uh, allow us to raise a, a round and, and eventually go on to grow the company. Okay, so in terms of founding team, like who else was you know super involved early on, and what were the different roles? Yeah, so uh, Arshan Debirziagi was a consultant at Aspect, and so he and I did the early work on you know just getting the concept to work, and then a number of other folks at Aspect uh, joined the team there. So uh, you know folks like Harold McGinnis and Ed and Sinai and uh, Oh, Dan Feidler and Shane DeBirziaghi also. So we had a, a nice team of folks that uh, helped us get that product off the ground. Matt Austin joined us uh, a little later. Those guys are super security researchers and and great developers. And so uh, you know they really helped us move the technology along in the early years. And so this is a mainly a technical team, or are there any anyone doing sort of sales and marketing early on? Well, we leaned on the aspect sales team a little bit. Well, actually, a lot. Right, so Pete Dean was instrumental in uh, helping us sell contrast to some of the New York firms, and uh, so you know it was interesting because we had that you know the the aspect infrastructure in place. You know we didn't have to do things like you know finance and accounting and HR and like that. Those things were all in place. Mm. Yeah, that's great. So now it's a year in. You have a couple of customers who are using it. You raise eight million, and then is it? Go and and just scale, go to market, or is it still you know you were figuring out you know the product at that point still? I think there was still a lot of you know figure out product market fit in those days. You know we had our concept, but it was still it was a lot of evangelism and a lot of uh, legwork to get customers. Really, we just had to show it to customers. Once they saw it, customers generally love it. But you know it's a lot of uh, sort of face to face meetings to get them to see it and to get them to try to understand it. It's uh, it's some work. But you know, we think it's so much better than the legacy SAS and DAS kind of scanners that you know it's very compelling once you actually see it. Now, interestingly, we, we, the first product was just the Assess product that just finds custom code vulnerabilities. Later, we added our library analysis piece, and then slightly later, we added the runtime protection piece. So you know, we sort of rolled those products out. You know, I'd say maybe every year we had a big release. Oh, nice. And so. It was first like discover, and then it was sort of discover in different, you know, like external libraries, and then it was protect. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. I mean, that makes that makes sense. <laughs> it's a good, be harder to go the other other direction, right? Well, I mean, we <laughs> we weren't the smartest about how we built all the product out. We had a number of features, like uh, you know, for instance, we had this gigantic rule editor built into the product for creating custom rules that you could create custom rules, and uh, it's all through the web app and. It was way too early for that. Nobody ever uses ever used that feature. We have a few customers using custom rules now, but it's really not that well adopted. So we pulled it out of the website, and you can still do it, but it's it's you know it was just too much extra fancy features to maintain. And so when you're developing those, you know, because that's three different important feature releases and sort of like new product introductions. Do you think about that in terms of like a product go to market? Like there's a you know an alpha, a beta, a GA. Or how do you think about releasing those different features? Are you doing the same iteration with early design partners? <laughs> well, it's a lot different today than it was back then. Uh, you know, back then we would just build it and uh, we'd put it in front of our customers and uh, you know try to get feedback. Now it's much more. You know, we're a DevOps shop now, so we release six or seven times a day. We've got uh, almost a hundred people on our development team, and they all work on different parts. So there's a team for the the Java agent and a team for the .NET agent and Ruby and Python and Node.js. We've got a team uh, focused on our OSS product. Uh, we've got another team on our Protect products. So we're pretty organized now, and the and the features roll out the way you'd think. We've got a well developed roadmap. We work with customers to get their requirements, and then we build uh, you know sort of an MVP version. We get feedback, and then uh, you know sometimes we release it under a feature flag, uh, so people can opt in, and then eventually it becomes you know, GA. But uh, it wasn't always that sophisticated. That kind of happened over time. Cool. So I'm guessing in the beginning it was just like, roll it out, show it to some customers, and someone's building a, you know, a piece of collateral to describe it, but now you sort of have a much more formalized process. Yeah, and uh, you know, so we put out a new roadmap every month, both internal and external facing roadmaps. So, uh, you know, we're, we're constantly thinking about how we adjust what we build to meet with customer demand. 
You know, so every time we talk to a new customer, we've got uh, it's all in Jira. If they ask for some feature, we note it in there, and uh, you know we keep track of who's asking for what, and that really helps drive our our roadmap forward. Okay, so then, I mean, I'm guessing you had some idea that you wanted to be able to offer, you know, the protect product, or was that all just based on customer demand? They were asking for it. So that was still pretty early, and I think uh, we had this idea that it would just make sense to have one product do application security across the entire lifecycle from the first line of code all the way through production and operation rather than having to buy you know four or five different appsec products and have a team around each one of them so you know we saw the same advantages in the protect environment that we see in the assess environment like having more information just makes you more accurate so really, I think we had this idea that it would just be uh, a much better mousetrap. So we decided to go build it. You know, we we did talk to people, but I think it wasn't something that they brought to us and say, "Hey, we really need this." Yeah. Okay. So that, I think it's a really interesting point, which is, you know, your roadmap is sort of combined with trying to execute on the vision for where you want the company to go and the offering you want to have and the how you want to be perceived in the market versus how do you want to take customer feedback and then use that as the impetus for delivering the next product? At this point, you know, it's a really complicated set of priorities. You know, the sales folks want a certain set of things. The product teams, you know, they've got a vision. You know, me as a founder and uh, an AppSec evangelist, I've got certain things that I, I want to be able to talk about that are sort of consistent with our story. And, you know, all those concerns have to be balanced in, in the roadmap. Ultimately, if it's not in the roadmap, it doesn't get done. We have to have a, a single source of truth in terms of what we're actually going to build. You know, I can't go to the engineering team and say, hey, look, I'm a founder. I just really need this feature. Can you do it? That's not how we do things. You know, it's, it's got to be balanced against all our other priorities. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Cool. And so kind of going a step back, you know, when you first introduced, you know, the product, you know, I looked at your pricing page and you have these two different tiers. You have the uh, community tier, which is free, and then you have the enterprise plan. So did you, you, I think you said you started off with just the enterprise plan. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. We just launched our uh, community edition uh, less than a year ago. Okay. So for the first, you know, what, I guess four four years. Yeah. This was just a, an enterprise offering, you know, contact us for pricing information? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then last year, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you decided to roll this out to really increase the top of funnel and get more folks trying out your software. And is, is that right? Well, I'd say really the biggest concern is like changing the way the market thinks about application security. You know, if you invent a flying car in your garage and you just drive it around your neighborhoods, you know, or maybe you just sell it to rich guys and and they drive it, like, you know, nobody's really going to ever find out about it. And we want to make sure the world knows there's a better way to do application security. And so we thought about it and we said, you know, what kind of community edition could we offer that would make sense? And we said, you know what? We don't want to do a feature restricted version of the product because then nobody's going to commit to using it. We want to give them the full thing. So we said, how can we somehow make that so that we're not just giving the product away and then our investors won't get really mad? Um, So we said, look, we'll give it to you the full thing for one application. And so that'll allow small enterprises that just have one app, like maybe it's just their website or they're doing some online commerce or whatever, they can use Contrast for free forever. And that's great. Uh, For bigger organizations, it gives them a way to easily try the product Individual projects can build it into their pipeline and and really get a ton of value. They can get that continuous compliance really quickly. And if they want to do more, if they like it and they want to do more, they can they can talk to us about a commercial license for the product. Currently, it's only Java. In one app in Java, uh, you can use Contrast on, but we're going to be releasing support for the other languages that we support very soon. So .NET, Node.js, Ruby, and Python, and oh, and .NET Core as well. So uh, those will all be coming out shortly. Cool. And so I always call this product assortment, right? Which is how do you decide which features to offer and which plan? Yeah. And so you know, it sounds like generally you, you wanted to make most of the features available for free. Do you hold back any features like you know security audit logging or 
your role-based access control or your single sign-on and only allow those to be used in the enterprise version? Yeah, it's not that we're holding them back. It's there's some features that don't make sense if you've only got one app. Like, you know, access control, for instance, if it's just one app team, you know, you don't need a complicated enterprise access control model, things like that. So we don't have like LDAP integration and a few features like that in the community edition, and it's all SaaS. So we're trying to make it really easy for folks so they can just use the SaaS. They don't have an on-prem option. Okay, right. Yeah. I mean, so that that's you know, our, our thesis is that you actually are better off holding some of those more complicated features back, right? Because that way you're not confusing, you know, the the sort of smaller companies and, and smaller teams with features that are really only required once you're doing this at massive scale. And so yeah, things like RBAC, just you know, granular RBAC doesn't make sense when you're uh, you know doing this for a couple of folks. Yeah. But we didn't want to do like a time limitation because then I think people won't commit to using it in their infrastructure. You know, if you've got a product that's going to time out in 30 days or 60 days or whatever, why would you build that into your pipeline? You're just going to have to rip it out. And that's not what we want people to do. We want people to really use contrast and make it part of their their new way of doing application security. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense. And so you also mentioned, you know, we we talk about deployment options. So you say you have SaaS only for the community edition, but you do have an on-prem version for your enterprise customers. Was that from day one, or did, how, how did that come about? It was from day one because remember we started with all these uh, Wall Street financial institutions, and uh, many of them at that time required on-premise, particularly for security products. That is changing. So you know now the majority of our customers use our SaaS. That actually, it's the vast majority of our customers use our SaaS. Even many of the very large financials, but there still are entities that they just won't do that. They're just not going to use a SaaS product, and so. Uh, we still support the on-premise product, and it's exactly the same. It's one code base, just a different way of of deploying. Yeah, so I'm guessing your application is written in Java as well, right? Based on the community edition and sort of the focus on Java early on, is that right? It is, and we're pretty happy with that choice. Our product has two pieces, right? It has our agents that run as part of your application. So for Java, it's a jar file, for instance. Sure. And that's where a lot of the complex security stuff happens, uh, all within you know your running application. But the contrast team server is the other piece. That's the piece that's either on prem or in our SaaS, and that's more straightforward. You know, it's a bunch of APIs, and uh, you know we use Spring and a bunch of standard kind of enterprise dashboard kinds of technologies. Cool. And so, you know, you're, you're bringing this out to market. Do you see the future of, of contrast as wide adoption across, you know, companies large and small, or do you think you'll continue to have a strong focus on, on enterprise customers? Well, uh, it, we're growing really quickly. So, you know, two years ago, we were probably 30 or 40 people. Now we're almost 200 and uh, we're going to be you know, another hundred by uh, early next year. So we see the market is really currently what we who we sell to is anybody building web apps or web APIs. We do sell to a lot of large enterprises, but we also have a team that focuses on companies with less than a thousand employees. So uh, you know they're they're doing really well, and we're seeing that market develop. So that's exciting. But ultimately, you know, this is thinking long term, is I think it's crazy to deploy applications without instrumenting them for security. And what I would say is, you know, everything that's complicated in the world, we instrument it so that we can know what's going on inside it. Like your car, totally instrumented. Industrial factories, instrumented like crazy for sound and fire and uh, vibration and everything. Temperature. Space shuttle. Airplanes, all super instrumented. But software, which is arguably the most complex thing man has ever built, is almost not instrumented at all. Log files are a terrible form of instrumentation. <laughs> so we think there's a real need and uh, for instrumenting applications, and security seems like the perfect use case for that. You know, it's, it's a little crazy to deploy these complex applications, bet your enterprise on this application, and have really no idea... You know whether it's vulnerable, whether you've got components that have vulnerabilities in them, and if someone's attacking them in production, most organizations don't know any of that, and that's nuts. So you know we're trying to change the world to a place where people actually know whether their stuff is secure or not. So it's a realistic goal for companies to know where all their code is running, 
across dev and QA and production, they should know. They should have an inventory that tells them exactly where all that code is, exactly what's in it. They should have a bill of materials for each one of those apps and you know, know which backend connections each one of those apps is making. They should have a point of contact for each one. And they should have a live dashboard that shows them, you know, here's what security looks like for that app. It should say, hey, you've got uh, 12 vulnerabilities in dev, but in QA, only two. And in production, you're being attacked from these places and they're using these kinds of attacks and you know they're targeting these business functions. You should know all of that for all of your applications all the time. And it's possible to do that in parallel across very large portfolios. We have many customers that have many thousands of applications that are getting all that telemetry all in parallel. And you know when you start thinking about that, all those applications secure in parallel. You can really see the weakness of the sort of the scanning paradigm where you have to scan one app and then move to the next one, scan it, produce a PDF report that goes to some experts, scan the next one, and, and so on. It's just a, you know that that sort of strobe light visibility just doesn't cut it in uh, 2019. Yeah, the speed of development, the speed of everything we're going. I think that you know application vendors have to think about delivering. A very secure application, and then I think another part of it is is using other applications that are secure, right? We always talk about sort of the daisy chaining, right? So if contrast, you know, is using some other vendor that's insecure, that's a huge area of vulnerability. So we kind of all have to be cognizant of the security of all the tools we use, else it's just the the weakest link ends up being the the place where things break down and and data is leaked. Yeah, that's right. Nobody is uh, writing all of their code all the way down through the operating system these days, right? I mean, they're barely writing, you know, the code uh, even to do the application. Uh, especially, you know, the Node world is kind of infamous for this, right? Embedding so many different libraries to to perform small functions. Sure, and that I mean that totally makes sense to me. Why should anybody write a replace all function? They should use one that somebody's written and, and tested. Uh, I always tell people never write security mechanisms yourself. It's really hard. I, I ran a project at OWASP called the Enterprise Security API, where we said, hey, let's take the, you know, the top 120 methods that developers would need to write secure code and we'll just we'll write good versions of them. We'll test the hell out of them and we'll uh, provide them for free to anybody so that they can use these as a starting point. And you know, it, it's really hard. We wrote, you know, even simple things like validating strings and doing encoding and decoding and canonicalization. Like those things end up being really pretty tricky when you get right down to it. And so we spent, you know, several years building great library to do that. Yeah, this is one area where I think that security has done a much better job than sort of most other areas of development and even even DevOps, right? I think there's a lot of other areas of software development have like a not invented here syndrome, right? Where, oh, I didn't write it, so I don't trust it. Yeah. I think in security, it's often the opposite, where it's it's uh, it's understood that if you wrote your own you know, encryption library, you probably didn't do it correctly, and you should you know go with the the open primitive that's available and leverage that. And so, you know, have done a great job establishing the patterns, building the primitives, and making those available. Well, for sure, for encryption and hashing, but much less so for things like input validation and even access control. We see so many people writing their own access control mechanisms. You know, it ends up being just a, a big mess of Boolean logic. Uh, I think the message hasn't been received across all security controls equally. And so many people write their own encoding methods. They're like, oh, I just need to HTML entity encode this string, so uh, I'll just encode the less than and greater than signs and you know, maybe single quote. But then they forget about double quote or they forget about uh, certain edge cases on uh, you know, Unicode characters and, and things like that. And it, it ends up being really hard to get it perfectly right. So when you talk about access control, like are there specific tools or libraries that you think folks should be looking at for when they're developing their internal access control options? Yeah, so you know, generally I think people should stick to the options that are in the frameworks that they're using. So you know, if you're using Spring, then there's uh, some annotations you can add for access control. If you're using other frameworks, then you should use the the functions and features that are built into that framework. 
if you start trying to build your own or wedge in, you know, some, and that was ultimately, I think that was kind of the undoing of the Isaki project was that it was all standalone mechanisms. And so if you're using a framework, it gets really hard to use those standalone mechanisms because they're not integrated into the framework. You know, you can't just put an annotation. Instead, you got to make a bunch of complex method calls. So really, it ends up being the, the frameworks that end up winning here. So folks should really learn how to use their frameworks, study them, and come up with a secure coding guideline that says, here at company XYZ, here's how we do access control. You use this annotation in these locations, and here, and you have to, if there's an access control failure, then you need to catch that exception or test the result or whatever you do, and then make this log call and take this action to put up this error screen on the page. Like, you know, you got to spell that stuff out so that everybody does it consistently in every place through the product. Otherwise, you know, every developer is just going to do it a different way, and you're going to end up with these log files that are full of garbage and error screens that are all over the place. So, you know, you should just have a strategy for doing each of these things. Yeah, I'd, wow, I'd love to find a way to get a guide like that open sourced, you know, a, a, an internal, someone's internal uh, access control guidelines and provide that as a resource. That seems like something that, you know, other companies could model off of. So, well, here's the thing is I've come to this, you know, and I've probably written 50 of these secure coding guidelines over the years. I don't think people really read them. I think uh, you know mostly they go on the shelf and people write code the way they're going to write it. So my my thing now is we have to take that security guidance and turn it into code. It has to be automated as part of the software pipeline. And you know one way of thinking about contrast is is a platform for creating those guardrails around application behavior. So you know I'd love people to take those rules and articulate them as contrast rules that then get enforced automatically. So you can easily, if you had an access control pattern like the one I just said, you could easily put that into contrast and say, yep, in every one of our APIs, we have to make this access control check with this annotation, then we have to make this log method call, and then if there's an error, then you have to do this thing. And you know those kinds of behaviors are easy to verify in, in contrast, and I think that's how they ought to be verified because that's a way that developers get instant feedback. They'll get something that says, oh, you blew the access control policy. Here's what you need to do to fix it. Oh, okay. They'll just do it, fix it, check it in clean code, and then you're done with it. There's none of that downstream work on tracking and risk rating and putting in a risk register and making a ticket and uh, fixing it and retesting it and all that. All that work just goes away. Yeah, getting things surfaced immediately rather than you know having a, a long feedback loop I think is the key to to addressing those issues so yeah probably everybody's seen that chart that says you know if you fix it in dev it costs 1x if you fix it in you know test it's like 10x and if you fix it in, in production it's like 100x I think that chart's kind of wrong because I think it goes up really fast if you wait more than like I don't know 30 minutes after the vulnerability is uh, created and checked in, then the cost goes up dramatically. Like it's not a straight line; it's like a really bumpy curve. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If someone wants to find, you know, you mentioned you've written a bunch of these secure coding guidelines. You know, I, I obviously we mentioned the, the ISO one earlier. Are there any that you've written more recently that you're really that you think folks should take a look at? So I haven't done it in five years because I've been building a product company. So any of the guidelines I wrote back in the day are probably not super relevant, and they're also they were built for private companies. Okay, got it. The good news is they're not that hard to create. Like there's probably, you know, 15 major security areas that you want to deal with, and you could start with something like the OWASP ASVS project, that's the Application Security Verification Standard. It's got a real nice list of the kinds of things that you want to cover. It's a little more in depth than something like the OWASP Top 10. So, you know, you could start there and then go through each one and say, okay, well, how are we going to achieve this goal in our framework? And you might be using uh, React and you know Node.js on the server side. Maybe you're using some framework. You just say, hey, okay, given the, the technologies that we're using, what's our pattern for implementing these different features? How do we do authentication and access control and error handling and logging and uh, you know input validation and escaping and encryption? All those kinds of things. How do we do back-end connections? Are we going to put everything over SSL? Uh, where are we going to store the keys? Like you just got to figure all that stuff out, and then once you have it, you can turn those into. And it doesn't take that long. Once you have that, 
then you can try to think about, okay, now how could we automatically test this as part of every commit? Oh yeah, that makes sense. Kind of related to this, one of the really important patterns or primitives we see emerging is Kubernetes, right? And so we see more and more folks deploying applications to Kubernetes. And, you know, when they start that, you know, maybe they're deploying services and it's focused on reliability. Uh, but I think a lot of the Kubernetes ecosystem recently has had a focus on service mesh, right? And service mesh, be this Istio or Linkerd or console, they all sort of have some amount of claims around security and you know, system to system communications. Yep. So, do, do you have any thoughts around does the, part of this move from, you know, maybe this is the framework concept you're talking about? Does this move up a level from language specific frameworks into deployment specific frameworks? So, I guess I think that it's a pretty good place to enforce some of the security in the stack. Like, it's a nice place to put in rules about saying, hey, you got to have all your patches applied and your host up to date. You got to make sure you don't connect to arbitrary systems out on the internet. You know, you can do some of the zero trust kind of rules and enforce those there. But in terms of the application security, it's not a particularly good place, right? Because, you know, Kubernetes can't really see what code is running in the container. It can just see that there, there is a workload there and they're going to run it. But they won't have access to see something like SQL injection, for instance. Like that's just going to be, you know, a request coming in. The code's going to handle it and it's going to create some malicious query and it's going to send that to the database. And Kubernetes is not going to have anything to say about it. Yeah, sure. So I really think, you know, what you need is an instrumentation based approach to security across whatever stack you're using. So I'd love it if at the application layer you chose contrast to be that instrumentation based approach. But if you're using a container, maybe you're using uh, some Kubernetes-like product. Maybe you're using a Docker kind of product like Twistlock or Aqua. You know, maybe if you go down the stack, maybe you're doing something at the operating system or at the cloud level. Maybe you're using Threat Stack or Carbon Black or one of those. But like the products that are within the thing that needs to be secured, I believe is the the right approach to security. I think we're past this approach of scanning things from the outside. In the old days, scanning used to be the efficient thing to do because you'd set up a scanner and then you just scan stuff. And it was all very simple. But modern enterprise architectures aren't easy to scan. There's networks everywhere. There's internal systems and external systems and containers and cloud, and it's all over the place. And so now the easy thing to do is to just make an agent part of the stack that you're deploying and have it go everywhere. Wherever that stack goes, I don't care if you move that stack from an internal data center to an external one or to container, whatever, doesn't matter. The security goes with the workload then. Yeah, so your point is if you're trying to apply security you know, at the deployment runtime level, it's a little too late. You should be getting in there earlier, instrumenting you know, the application code. And you know, there's obviously security you know, at every layer that needs to be applied, but starting in the foundation is really important. Yeah, I think that's right. Cool. Jeff, this has been so good. I really appreciate it. This has been an amazing overview of sort of how folks should think about their internal application security, the security of their vendors. There's so many different areas where I'm, I'm thrilled for people to, to dive in some more. So thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure. This has been great. That's all we have time for today. If you're interested in being a guest on this show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, or just to learn more about enterprise features, find us at enterpriseready.io. To learn more about HeavyBit, visit heavybit.com to check out the library. It's packed with amazing talks on sales, marketing, product, and general management from founders of developer tools companies and other industry leaders.